your source for everything paranormal, Parapex. Throughout the ages, history has been altered by word of mouth and the misrepresentation of those who might not have been present when some of the world's most significant events took place. Channelers Barry and Connie Strom bring through the spirits of those who actually witnessed or took part in these historical events and lets them tell their stories in their own words. Welcome to Channeling History, and now, here are your hosts, Barry and Connie Strong. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Channeling History. Uh, hopefully you know by now that we're the only show where we speak to guests that are on the other side, and we're brought to you every week on Sundays by the Parrax Radio Network. I'm Barry Strom, your host, and I'll be doing the channeling and speaking the words of the spirits tonight. And I'm Connie Strom, your co-host, and I'd like to thank you also for tuning in to our show this evening. Uh, tonight, we will be interviewing the spirit of Eleanor Roosevelt, the wife of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and a great activist for women and minorities. She was also one of our first delegates to the United Nations following World War II. We welcome any questions you might have from the chat room. Yes, and we always try to give a small disclaimer. And when we begin, there's no idea whatsoever what the spirit guests are going to answer to our questions. So the opinions or statements voiced on our show are the channeled words of the spirits and do not necessarily reflect our opinions, those of the Parax Network, or of any of our sponsors. If you've listened to our show, you know that channeling history is very different from other shows. We only speak with spirits that have contributed to historic events or our holy spirits or archangels. Last week, we interviewed the soul of Queen Victoria. She was the Queen of England for over 60 years. The interview is available on Potomatic.com and our YouTube channel, should you like to listen. Okay, several weeks ago, <clears throat> we tried our first Spirit Roundtable discussion. We had John Maynard Keynes, Bishop Fulton Sheen, and Albert Schweitzer on, and we did a discussion for over an hour. We received a lot of very common positive comments on the show, and we were especially happy that we were able to pull it off. Now, next week, we're going to do another group discussion. This time, it's going to be John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and Aunt Alexander Hamilton. It's going to focus on our Constitution, how it was formed, what went into its making, and how it is being followed in modern America. I Trust me, this one is going to be very, very interesting. So join us. Tell your friends about the show. You don't want to miss this one. And please submit suggestions for future shows or questions for our spirit guests to our email, channelinghistoryonparax at gmail.com. Okay, now if you listen to our show, you also know that we never start without a prayer. So Connie, start the prayer, and then we're going to get on with our guest, Ellen Roosevelt. God, please grant us your wisdom and protection. Grant us the knowledge that we can handle and keep us safe from all things that will harm us. Keep the messages positive and pure love. Keep us safe from our egos. We ask these things in the light of the seen, the unseen, and the honesty of God. Amen. Eleanor, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Would you like to begin with a message? Yes, I believe I would. I lived in a very, very interesting and dangerous time for the country. I was born. I lived through two world wars. My husband was president during the Second World War. He was elected for four terms. I wound up as a, one of the early delegates to the United Nations. I was blessed to have the opportunity to have a great effect on many people. Sometimes the effect might not have been as good as I would have liked. Sometimes it was certainly worse. But I think through my life I managed to help a lot of people. It was a time where many things were changing in the country. We had a Great Depression, a World War, 
it was it, it was a very difficult time. So I know you've got some very interesting questions, and I'm looking forward to answering them. So, Connie, if you would like to begin, I'll try to answer them for you. I would definitely like to begin. Uh, would you start by telling us about your parents? Well, I guess you could say I was raised with a silver spoon in my mouth. My parents were wealthy. They were socialites. But my father was an alcoholic. He actually, he and mom actually died before I was 10 years old. I had all the benefits of wealth in my childhood, but my parents, now my mother was, I'm not saying anything bad about my mother. She was a wonderful person. I wish I could have known her longer, but losing your, both your parents at an early age is very traumatic. Well, the rest of my family did the best they could raising me, and I did wind up marrying a very interesting individual. So my parents, I wish I would have known them longer. I know them better now since I'm on this side, but they did losing them did have a an effect on my life. I suffered with depression because of it, a lot of grief, a lot of uncertainty. But can't say too much about them because I didn't have them that long. Uh, what was it like growing up in a wealthy family in the late 1800s? The late 1800s, early 1900s was pretty much the heart of the Industrial Revolution. Many things were taking place. Automobiles were being invented. As I said, my family was very wealthy. I had tutors. They could afford to do pretty much what I wanted to do. They sent me abroad to study when I was 15 to England, and I attended one of the best late women's schools, colleges in the country. In those days, socialites were a very big deal. You would have a great big coming out party when you were 18. It was... Uh, it was a time of opulence. The families that had the money showed it. The families that had to work were living in poverty. It wasn't that much different than it is now. Certain families had great wealth, and the vast majority of people were working. You were the niece of Theodore Roosevelt, the 26th president of the United States. Did he have any effect on your political beliefs as you were growing up? Not really. I know that he did a lot for the country, and I thought basically he was a very good president. I know all of our family talked about him and supported him, and I, I know that I knew at the time that he was doing a lot for natural resources, for national park systems. I didn't really agree with a lot of his warlike tendencies. I always thought that I was more of a pacifist, and I don't think anybody could say that Theodore was a pacifist. Okay. Um, as you said, at the age of 15, you were sent to a girls' boarding school in London. How did that affect your life? It had a great effect on my life. I was privileged to have an incredible teacher and tutor over there. She taught me how to cherish the rights that women had, how to know that women were capable of doing much more than they were allowed to do at that time. She introduced me to a lot of liberal thinking that I had not been aware of. She taught me that what is inside your, your soul is what's really important, and it's how you affect others that will be what is remembered. The good, well, I did not get along very well with some of the girls at the school. It was still one of the happiest times of my life. What were your religious beliefs? 
I was a, I was a Christian. I believed in God. I believed that the Gospels were the, the foundation of the of the Christian religion. Sometimes I had doubts about some of the teachings. I watched many of the churches other than the one of which I was a member. I thought that at times people thought more of the church than they did of God. But I believed in God. I prayed. I asked for guidance. And I remained faithful to those beliefs throughout my life. That's wonderful. Uh, tell us about your courtship with Franklin Roosevelt. He was a distant cousin. We had met, and we were having a secret courtship. We tried to keep it from our families for a while because we felt that they would probably disagree with it. Franklin was a very good-looking man, very charming, very intelligent, very well-spoken. We talked during our courtship that he wanted to enter a life of politics. It was basically the way people with a lot of money did things in those days. We had a wonderful wedding, and then... We settled down to our married life. Why did you decide to marry Franklin, other than the fact that he was handsome and smart? I thought that we shared many beliefs. He truly wanted to run for political office. I thought that I could support him. I thought that it would enable me to strengthen some of the beliefs that I had. And in my heart, I wanted to be able to help others. And I thought that if he achieved some degree of political success, that it would rub off and I would be able to succeed at some of the things that I wanted to do in life as well. So when you married him, did you think he would actually become president? No. I thought that he would obtain fairly high political office. I knew that he had designs on being the governor of New York. He joked about the fact that maybe he'd be president sometime and I'd be first lady, but I thought he was just kidding. He was actually much more serious about wanting to be president than I, than I thought when we were courting. Once we married and I started to have children... I didn't really have a lot of control over what he was doing. And as time went on, he certainly did obtain political office, the highest in the United States. What was your opinion of Franklin's, Franklin's mother, Sarah? Well, let's just say I didn't really care for her. She was overbearing tried to run our lives, threatened to cut off Franklin's money if she, he didn't do what, what she wanted him to do, wanted to take over raising our children, was opinionated, was arrogant. But besides that, she was a pretty good person. <laughs> You're kind. <laughs> How did World War I affect your lives? Well, Franklin was appointed to a military a, a, a military position. I was always a pacifist. I truly hoped that World War I wouldn't break out, but it did. I watched the effect, the incredible, terrible effect that the war had on Europe, had on our people, we had boys that were going off to fight that didn't return, how that affected the families. World War I taught me just how terrible war was. I had never seen it up close and personal before, but 
It made me want to work to assure that a future war would not happen. I was pretty much involved with raising my children, so I did what I could, but in those days, my time was pretty well spoken for. Having six children, losing one of them, that will affect your life in a great way. So, World War I did affect me mentally and let me know. It gave me an idea of what I wanted to do with my future. Who is Lucy Mercer, and how did she affect your relationship with your husband? Lucy Mercer was worked for me, and she also had an affair with my husband. One day I discovered a catch of love letters that she had written, and it knocked me off my feet. I was, I was heartbroken after it. I never thought that Franklin would have affairs with other women. I tried to, I showed love for him. I had his children. I tried to do what he asked. I tried to support him. And he rewarded me by having an affair with someone that worked for me. Why didn't you divorce him? I offered to divorce him. He was afraid that a divorce would deeply affect his political career. Keep in mind that in those days, morals were much different. Divorce was frowned upon, and especially the fact that he would have been the instigator of the divorce. His mother, Sarah, intervened and tried to convince me how important it was that we stayed together. I felt that his career was fairly important. I didn't want to hurt it. So... I did agree to stay with him, but from that point on, our relationship certainly changed. Yes, how did it change? From that time on, we didn't have any physical relationships. We became more like, I guess, business partners. He would ask my advice, and I would give him honest advice because I wanted him to succeed. Because I realized that if he succeeded, it would also give me the opportunity to try to do some of the things that I wanted to do. In 1921, Franklin was diagnosed with paralytic disease. How did you react to that diagnosis? It hit us like a ton of bricks. He was always handsome. He was always athletic. He was very, he could do many things physically. All of a sudden, he was in a wheelchair. We thought that it was polio. We realized that his life could be in danger from what was going on. I thought that his political career was over. He was in deep depression. He also thought that he he would get out of politics. I told him that he needed to continue. I told him that even though he was paralyzed from the hip down, that he really had much to offer the country. I thought that if he didn't remain in politics, his depression would be overwhelming. I truly worried about his future I thought that politics would give him a goal that would allow him to, at least in the short run, forget about the fact that he was paralyzed. 
He had all these mental facilities. He had all these upper body strengths. He just simply had problems walking. He was paralyzed. His legs would not respond to the commands. I thought that a future in politics would be the only thing that would keep him stable. And I believe that I was right. I believe you were too. What was your opinion of J. Edgar Hoover? Hoover had his own ideas of how the Constitution affected the FBI. He was surveilling people for no reason. He was watching over things. He was always in the background. He was trying to heavily influence my husband. I really, truly disliked J. Edgar Hoover. He was an evil person. He only cared about his future. He cared about how he could influence the government, how he could influence the decisions of my husband. He had a super ego. I really can't think much good about J. Edgar Hoover. He was even surveilling me. He was keeping files on my activities. He hated the fact that I was speaking a liberalism that he didn't agree with. All in all, I think J. Edgar was, was quite a threat to the, to the democracy during his time in power. Who was Lorena Hickok? Lorena Hickok was a newspaper reporter. We became very close and best friends. I know that many people believe that I had a physical and personal relationship with Arena, and they are correct. During those days, when a woman loved another woman, it was very disgraceful. Christians were firmly against anything with same-sex relationships. Lorena was intelligent. Lorena had a great imagination. She was a great conversationalist. Keep in mind that my husband was having external relationships. And I just felt that I needed to love and care for somebody. My husband and I were estranged. Lorena was present. She had, she had a great personality. And I just simply fell in love with her. So yes, we definitely had a personal relationship. And she was and still is a great soul. Did Franklin know about this relationship and how did he react to it? I think he fully expected that I would have a personal relationship with, with other men. He was certainly doing his thing with other women. And I knew that he encouraged me to have relationships as well. He didn't expect that I was going to have a relationship with another woman. When he learned about it, he was quite taken aback. He was afraid that if it became public knowledge, it would have a bad, a bad effect on his political career, especially the fact that I was first lady of the nation. I'm sure that I was the first, first lady that would have had a relationship with another woman. How would you describe your marriage with Franklin? In the beginning, it was a normal marriage with children. Once that he started to have the relationship with other women, I couldn't be with him intimately anymore. 
we had what you would describe as a business relationship. He would rely on me for information. When he was president, I would travel the country, get ideas from the people. I would give him suggestions on how to proceed in certain matters. We never really fought that much. Now, we did when I found out he was having the, the first relationship. But once our, our relationship stabilized and we understood each other, most people would have divorced. But because of his relationship, we did not. So it wasn't that tumultuous, but I guess, a, I guess like two people with a business agreement. That would probably be the best, uh, best way to describe it. Who was Earl Miller? Earl became a very close friend of mine after the death of my husband. I needed someone to confide in and talk to. He was he was a very, very good person. He and I became very close. We never had a physical relationship, but we were very, very deeply emotionally involved with each other. He supported many of my ideas, contributed ideas on his own. Earl was a very, very good person, the closest of personal friends and advisors. I cannot say anything but good about Earl. What was your opinion about Jews? I must admit that... In the beginning, I had some doubts about members of the Jewish faith. Once we saw the imminence of World War II and we started to understand how the Jews were being abused, I realized that my initial impressions of them were were false. I tried to do as much as I could to alleviate their suffering, to find them places that they could flee from the Nazi Germans. It has been said that I was anti-Semitic, but I did have negativity, but I would never, ever consider myself truly anti-Semitic. As I grew older, I understood the equality of all humans, and I realized that they were among the most abused religions in the world and that they truly needed our help. Okay, let's back up a little bit. Uh, Franklin was inaugurated as president in 1933. How did you react to becoming the first lady? I was incredibly nervous about it. I I had met previous first ladies. I understood that many of them had remained in the background and had done very little. That in those days, political strength was generally attributed to males. I had my own agenda. I wasn't sure how an aggressive first lady would be met by the public. I had many things that I wanted to accomplish. I knew from the beginning that I did not want to remain in the background. I wanted wanted to establish new precedents for first ladies, and I wanted to use the power of the presidency to truly help others. Okay, let's take a small break here. Uh, We will be back in about two and a half minutes. Don't go away. Channeling History will return right after these brief messages. In order for the light to shine so brightly, the darkness must be present. Tune in every Monday at 10 o'clock 
the dark sun rising on the Para-X Radio Network. Hi, this is Marla Brooks from Stirring and Cauldron. Thursdays are a great night on the Para-X Radio Network. We start off the evening with Journey into the Light, Chapter 3, with your hosts, Psychic Little T and Tabby Cat Gash at 7 p.m. Eastern. Then, on the first and third Thursdays of the month at 8 p.m., it's Tango and Friends, hosted by Bruce Tango. And on the alternate Thursdays at 8 p.m., tune in to Stirring the Cauldron, the Archive podcast. Every week at 9 p.m. Eastern, join me on Stirring the Cauldron Live. And then at 10 p.m., stick around for New Aeon Now with Lily Alley, Davron Michaels, and Christine Matza. Finally, to round out the night, join Dr. Kelly Renee Schutz on the Paranormal Encounters podcast. All this, every Thursday, right here on Para-X. Have you ever wondered what Jesus and his followers would say if you could receive their messages today? In his new book, Spirits Speak, Channeling Jesus and the Holy Spirits, channeler and author Barry Strom answers those questions for you. Using his gift of spirit communication, he brings you messages from such Holy Spirits as Moses, John the Baptist, Mary Magdalene, Mother Mary, Jesus, and even Mother Teresa and the Reverend Billy Graham. They discuss topics that are important for contemporary life in these troubled times. Spirits Speak, Channeling Jesus and the Holy Spirits is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and other booksellers. Signed copies are available on the author's website, spiritspredict.com. After reading this book, you will never again say, What would Jesus say or do? Welcome back to Channeling History. Now, here are your hosts, Barry and Connie Strom. Okay, welcome back. Connie, we've got a lot more questions. We do indeed. Uh, Eleanor, you spoke about you felt that some of the precedents needed to be changed of the First Lady. So what, what were some of the precedents that you did change? I started trying to actively encourage women. I started to try to work against the segregation that was still present in our country. I tried, I wrote a weekly newspaper article. I tried to pursue many liberal policies. I traveled around the country and I would I would speak. I would always try to encourage women to pursue anything that a man could do. I was I believe a truly the first lady activist in the White House. What is your opinion of the last three First Ladies? I have mixed opinions. I think that all three tried to do some good things. I think that some of them tried to do things that the people did not want to do and accept. Sometimes I think today the First Ladies might try a little too hard. I know that they have quite a bit of control over their husbands now. I believe that the last three first ladies could have accomplished a lot more. I think that if they would have truly tried to help all groups, I know many of them tried to work with the younger generation, but telling the younger generation what they can do and what they can't do generally does not work. I think if the First Lady, the current First Lady, steps back and tries to do things for all people, that she would be much more successful she t- she is going to face many people hurting in the country. The inflation rate and the recession that the country will be following will be a test for this administration. 
if she is strong and if she tries to help everyone, I think she still can do a good job. Okay, we have a question from one of our listeners. What did you think of Harry Truman and his presidency? I thought that Harry did the best he could do. Harry was faced with many challenges. He had to make a terrible decision about the use of the atom bomb. He decided, he weighed using the bomb against the loss of probably 200,000 of our own boys if they were to have attacked Japan. Harry, Harry followed his beliefs. Harry was honest, and he tried to do what he felt was best for the country. He named me to the United Nations, and he tried to support a lot of the things that I did. So in general, I think that Harry was a much better president than what people give him credit for. Uh, What was your opinion on racial discrimination at those days? I truly believed all men were created equal. I thought that it was terrible that we still had such racial discrimination, especially in the armed forces. I tried to get my husband to do more about it, but he was afraid that he would alienate the voters in the South and the Southern senators. I tried very hard to do as much as I could. I invited black people to the White House. I treated them equally as they should be treated. I did as much as I could. It was still a difficult time in our country, and there was still too much hatred. It's much better now, but there is still a lot to do. What was the Arthurdale experiment? We had many poor miners in West Virginia, and I tried to set up I guess you would call it a type of social settlement for them. I thought that we were trying to help people, but I guess human nature took over. It was a failed experiment. At least I tried to do something. What was the New Deal? The New Deal was the entirety of all of the legislative packages that we tried to bring in to help the people. It was the CCC, the the Conservation Corps. They did much to build roads and work in the national forests. It was Social Security. It was an attempt to provide medical care. We did many things. Now, this is something that my husband and I worked together on. We tried to put money into the economy. This was, this was a new area for us. This was the first time that we tried, through government intervention, to end a recession and a very deep depression. We felt that the only way that we could do that was through government stimulus. We had to put people to work. There were just simply too many individuals that couldn't find jobs. Some of the program worked. Some of it didn't. The New Deal definitely changed the path of big government. It began social programs, and it did some very good things. It didn't end the Depression as we thought it would. Actually, it took the World War to do that. But it kept everything going. It was an entirely new way of thinking. And I had an awful lot to do with many of the decisions that were made by my husband. Okay, After Pearl Harbor, Franklin signed an order placing Asian Americans in internment camps. How did you react to that action? I thought it was absolutely terrible. I thought that it was against the Constitution. I thought he was violating human rights. 
I told him all those things, but he told he informed me that he was under great political pressure and that he thought that the upside of what he was doing was much greater than the downside. It was a black mark on our country. Why did you hold all female reporters' press conferences? In those days, all of the press reporters were male, and I thought that was a terrible thing. I wanted to encourage women to get into the reporting business. I wanted them, I wanted female reporters to be treated the same as male reporters. So when I would hold a press conference, I would restrict it to female reporters. Now, it certainly irritated a lot of members of the press, but I could have cared less. Uh, we have another question out of our chat room. Was the last presidential election fraudulent? There was some problems with some of the voting things, but there always is. As we watched from this side, we didn't see any any great fraud. We're not aware on this side of of any extreme fraud that would have changed the results of the election. There is a great possibility of fraud, especially when you're dealing with mail-in ballots. I'm old-fashioned. I think people should still go to the polls to vote, but things are changing. I do know that they're putting a lot of security measures in for the next elections, and I think that uh, they'll probably work. I certainly hope so. Okay, as you mentioned, um, after you left the White House, President Truman appointed you as a delegate to the United Nations General Assembly. Uh, at that time, what was your opinion of the United Nations? At the time, I thought it was was the only available answer for trying to get peace in our time. The Soviet Union was growing. The Cold War was beginning. I felt that the United Nations would give, in a, give the nations of the world an opportunity to meet, speak, compromise, and perhaps lay a way that says there would be no more wars. Okay, now that you're on the other side, has your opinion changed? Sadly, the United Nations has become this huge bureaucracy. Many of the belligerent nations of the world have, have got positions of control. Some of the greatest civil rights violators are controlling committees and organizations dealing with civil rights. I fear that there has to be another answer. The United States or the United Nations could still be successful, but it would take almost a total reorganization. It changed so much since the time that I was there. In your opinion, Eleanor, is there any type of organization that could truly lead the world to peace? The only way that the world is going to lead to peace is for everybody to understand that they have to get along. As long as there are people that want to rely simply on violence, that want to rely on weapons of mass destruction to get what they want. I'm not sure what the true answer is. Obviously, the answer is people have to learn to coexist. I do not see that happening anytime soon. Sadly, I think you're correct. Uh, what is your opinion of Cardinal Francis Spellman? We had many very strong disagreements. I was very liberal. I, for instance, was in favor of birth control. Cardinal Spellman was not. He was very outspoken, and he and I had many disagreements. Let's just say that we did not get along well. Were you anti-Catholic? No, absolutely not. I was against some of their, of, of their church ethics, but I did not hold anything for, against the Catholic people. I thought they were wonderful. God says the same thing. 
All of your life, you were a member of the Democratic Party. What is your opinion of today's Democratic Party? I have mixed opinions of the Democratic Party today. I was very liberal all my life, and the Democratic Party of today is trying to become more and more liberal. In many areas, they are pushing ideas that are only supported by a liberal minority. The Democratic Party needs to return to be the party of the, of the small person. Today, all of the great wealthy peoples are a member of the Democratic Party. In my time, the wealthy people were Republicans. If the Democratic Party used the great wealth of their members to truly help people, they could return to being the greatest party in the country. Right now, their fate is in their hands. If they pursue ideas that are contrary to the vast majority of the people, then they will fail. If they return to being the party of the, truly the party of the people and the working class, and they follow the tenets that they followed in the past that made them successful, then things will go well for them. If they continue to hold extreme positions, things will not go well. So let's give equal time. What is your opinion of the current Republican Party? When you're over here, you're not supposed to be very negative about things. We've seen a, justip a juxtaposition between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. Today, the Republicans are trying to be the, the, the party of the common person, and the Democrats are the party of the elitists. There are many good Republicans, just as there are many good Democrats. There are many extreme Republicans that have right-wing ideas that can be as harmful to the country as there are liberals in the Democratic Party that have ideas that can also be harmful. If each party at this time would elect representatives that represent the common and middle interests, you'd be able to get cooperation in our government. Do you see any way that the two parties will ever cooperate? It's difficult, but I think that necessity will force them to cooperate. If the voting people start to remove the extremists on both sides, I think you'll see cooperation begin. Oh, I hope so. Why did you not support the Equal Rights Amendment? I thought that there was satisfactory legislation and that the Equal Rights Amendment was really not required. I thought that there might be some negative kickback on it. It's just basically I just thought that the legislation was sufficient. Yeah. Um, in life, you were a supporter of spending on social programs. What is your opinion of today's national debt of $24.3 trillion? Is um, there any way that that could ever be paid back? I'm staggered by the amount of the national debt. We ran, we ran the national debt up, but we were not doing it in such immense proportions. We got results with our spending through the New Deal. Today you look at the, at the trillions in national debt and you don't see much results. Social Security is about to go bankrupt. You have many social problems. The inner cities are in terrible shape, your roads, your bridges. I have to question what you got for that, for the, for that spending. At least we had an idea of what we were getting. The country has got to slow down on spending. 
They can slow down, eliminate waste, and do a ton of good, run a ton of good programs. But as long as they continue to waste money like they do, I- I'm not sure what the future holds. Yeah. In life, what was your opinion about abortion? I was pro-abortion. I thought that women should have the right, the strength to make their own decisions. Now that you're on the other side, have you changed your opinion? Yes. <clears throat> now that I'm on the other side, I understand that God is not in favor of abortion. I looked at it as a rights issue. He looks at it as a moral issue. And as a moral issue, abortion is certainly wrong. Yeah. Was there any racial bias in the New <clears throat> Deal legislation? Unfortunately, there was. It was because of the strength of the Southern Bloc, there were very few things that we could really do through legislation in the New Deal to prevent racial bias. I wish we could have done much more in that area. There were many times as First Lady that you disagreed with your husband. What do you consider the greatest disagreement? Oh, we had some, we had several. I think that one of our greatest differences was that I wanted to do more for racial equality. He thought that it was something not to be touched. I thought that we could have done more to try to find peace. He felt that we needed to strengthen the military, and he was right. It was inevitable that we were going to be thrown into war with Germany. I think the strongest disagreement we had was that he was not doing enough for equality. Throughout your life, you were the epitome of liberalism. What is your opinion of the liberal movement today? I'm in favor of the liberal movement and, and social programs and trying to help the poor, having social nets. I think that there should be universal medical care. I do think that today we're seeing the liberal movement moving to the extreme left to the point that they're going to generally turn off the center of the country. If the liberal movement wises up and moves their beliefs to the center, and then uses the power that they gain from that move to gain momentum in working for more social measures, I think that the independent voter can be won over to their side. Extreme liberalism is just going to turn off the individual's in our country, and they will lose any strength that they ever thought they had. So liberals have to be very careful today. Extremism in the right or the left is not a good thing. Okay. What countries do you see as the greatest future risk to the future of the United States? I think China represents the greatest risk. Although... They're businessmen, and I think that they will show common sense, but they're the greatest violators of human rights in the world today. There's going to be a time that I think the other countries are going to have to try to stand up to them. Iran is incredibly dangerous because they're run by religious fanatics, and whenever you have someone that would rather kill themselves and take everybody with them, you have a real problem. I think Russia, even though they have all these nuclear weapons, has made a major mistake, and I don't think they're going to be major players in the future. Okay. Okay. Eleanor, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's been a very interesting conversation and educational. Uh, do you have a final message for us? Yes. I would like all of you to look around and think about what you can do for others. Throughout my life, I tried to do that. 
I tried to help. I tried to end racial discrimination. I tried to provide social nets. I think that the Social Security that we came up with in the New Deal was one of the greatest programs. I think that the government should assure the longevity of the program. I think that the government needs to step back and think about what they need to do that is best for the country. I think they should cut out waste. And I think they need to limit the growth of government. They need to protect the environment. They need to provide work for those that cannot, that cannot find jobs. I think there's many things that they can do. I think that the government needs common sense. They need to understand that debts have to be paid back. They need to come up with a realistic plan to pay back what they've taken from their children and, and the grandchildren. Those are the ones that are going to suffer. If the younger generation doesn't wise up and understand that there are times that you just have to tighten your belt and do what you have to do, the government's government and our country's in for a long, hard time. So thank you for letting me speak tonight. I appreciate it. I truly enjoyed it. If you would want me to come back again, I would be happy to do so. So good night, and thank you for listening. Thank you so much for joining us, Eleanor. God bless you. Okay, next week, as I said, we're going to have another roundtable discussion. We're going to be discussing the, con discussing the Constitution with James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, and Alexander Hamilton. Those are the three founding fathers that were most responsible for writing the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Now, keep in mind that the Constitution came long after the Articles of Confederation and the Direct Declaration of Independence. The Constitution was to lay the basis for the country. It was to lay the basis for the future of how the country reacted to situations and the laws that they would follow. I know personally I can't wait because I'm dying to see what these spirits have to say about our current government. You can submit questions, recommendations for future shows in advance through our email, channeling history on parax at gmail.com. My new book, Spirit Speak, Channeling Jesus and the Holy Spirits, is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kindle. We put it up there for $2.99, so nobody out there has an excuse not to look at it. Signed copies of, our book, of all my books are on my website, spiritspredict.com, wordsofgodthenandnow.com. And in, I think, about six weeks, we're going to have a new, our eighth book available. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed tonight's show. I thought Eleanor was an extremely interesting and straightforward guest. Thank you for listening. Please join us Sundays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on the Parax Radio Network. And I would also like to thank you all for and <laughs> <laughs> kind of for joining us this evening. <laughs> I apologize. I promise you I wasn't drinking. I'm allergic to alcohol. <laughs> but anyway, all of you have a wonderful week, and God bless you all. Thanks for listening to Channeling History. Tune again next week for another electrifying episode as we never know who will make an appearance or who will come through the portal. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2020. Our story begins by Kevin McLeod, licensed through Incompetech.com.